14-year-old Tremaine uh, McMillan was confronted by Miami-Dade uh, police officials while he was playing with some friends on a beach. Apparently, he was roughhousing, and the following happened. Everybody needs to back up. Once he's in custody, stop resisting. This video captures a Miami-Dade police officer with his arm around the neck of 14-year-old Tremaine McMillan. I feel that that right there should never happen. McMillan's mother captured this scene with her cell phone. The police confronted McMillan when they saw him slam another teen on the sand of Hollover Beach. McMillan says his back was bruised and his six-week-old puppy, Polo, injured his left paw when police pried them apart before this takedown. So he was unarmed. Uh, police officials say uh, uh, yeah. that uh -huh. he had a puppy. Well, and yeah, puppy. wait a minute. That, and apparently he clenched his fist at some point. Yeah. So tell us and all he about also that. allegedly gave police a dehumanizing glance or stare. Mm. Mm. Oh, <laughs> okay. Now, look. That's all it takes. Just give him a dehumanizing stare. Now, he, so first of all, if you see the guy slamming somebody on the ground, okay, you go inquire. Nothing wrong with that at all. That's exactly what you're supposed to do as cops. Apparently, there was not a situation at hand. And uh, they asked him where his mom was. He says he was going to show them where his mom was. And so he started walking that way. He's 14 years old, okay? Uh, that's when the cops said, oh, you walking away from me? And then this quote, I think, is really telling. They say, of course we have to neutralize the threat in front of us. And when you have somebody that is being resistant, somebody that is pulling away from you, somebody that's clenching their fists, somebody that's flaring their arms. He wasn't flailing his arms, he had a puppy. Right. That's the immediate threat, they say. Okay, but wait a minute. If he's pulling away from you, how is he an imminent threat? Yeah, how, how that is, doesn't make any sense at all. If he had all. a puppy and he's walking away from you, he couldn't have been flailing his arms at an imminent threat. Maybe the other fist was clenched and maybe he gave the dehumanizing stare, which must have been very, very profoundly emotionally difficult for those guys. Yeah, now look, again, this is down, this is another layer of absurdity, right? In the Todashev case, they said he had attacked the FBI with a knife and well, what can you do? We had to shoot him dead, right? Now, uh, then later they said, okay, he didn't have a knife, but he turned the table over. So that's why we had to shoot him seven times, including in the head. That's the guy that was connected to Tom Lanzarnia, right? Now in this case, he doesn't have a gun, he has, it doesn't have a knife, he doesn't have to overturn a table. In fact, he's walking away from them. Okay, so he's obviously not a threat. Mm -hmm. This is the definition of not being an imminent threat when you are leaving, right? But they say, I think I saw a clenched fist at some point. Oh, come on. And, and now you're going to judge where I have my hands and where I have my fingers. And then even that, like, is such weak sauce, they throw in the what kind of stare? Dehumanizing stare. And also, <laughs> I mean... Oh, that 14-year-old with the puppy dehumanized you. That's why you had to body slam him and hold him in a chokehold. It's devastating for them. And to be fair, my, it was more of a sleeper hold than a chokehold. Um. <laughs> so I always go back to this whenever we do these stories uh, that uh, involve excessive force. How great is it that you have the ability to tape this on your smartphone and then it becomes a national story? Because, I don't know, a decade ago, 15 years ago, you wouldn't have the ability to do it and no one would be talking about it. People would, you know, spread rumors about excessive force and, you know, others would question it and speculate about it. But now you have actual evidence of it taking place. He's a skinny little 14-year-old kid. Right? He didn't pose a threat. He was unarmed. He didn't do anything wrong. And obviously the information that the cops are giving conflicts with what they're trying to say. And the other thing is they arrested him for resisting arrest. Now they threw a disorderly conduct in there, but the lead charge that's a felony is resisting arrest. But what were you arresting him for in the first place? He <laughs> you can't just arrest somebody for resisting they arrest. They clearly <laughs> thought he mouthed off to him or dehumanized them with his vicious stare uh, and walked away from them. I assume they said, stay there, and he went and walked where he uh, says. I'm goes, sure that's what happened, uh, right. And they thought, hey, don't walk away from us. And so yeah. they went and got him, and they, you know, as, as the difference between good police officers and bad police officers, and obviously I don't know all the facts here. We have his version of the story and theirs, and mm -hmm. the truth is perhaps somewhere in between. Um, but good police officers, when somebody walks away from them and they're not a threat, might get angry, but they still don't need to have it escalate to that point. There's a yeah. lot of ways to solve that. Go get in front of them, put your hand out, put your hand on them, and say, I'm gonna run you in in about five seconds if you don't shut up and stop moving. Yeah, right. you know? and, and not and, only did they hurt a 14-year-old kid, they hurt a harmless little puppy. And uh, when the detective was asked about the puppy, he said, quote, at this, at this point, we are not concerned with a puppy. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that's the clinching quote, I love that. The puppy's hurt. You saw the puppy. How precious is the puppy, right? 
And they're like, this situation is so dire. At this point, we are not concerned about a puppy, okay? We had a 14-year-old with a menacing stare. It dehumanized me. And you're talking about a puppy? Okay. Now, look, the overall point that's important and why people are upset about this story is because it happens all the time. And it's reflective. It's symbolic of the abuse that a lot of people deal with with cops when, you know, of course it's not all the cops. We talk about it all the time in the context of don't judge all cops by it. At the same time, you got to regulate yourself so that you don't lose the trust of the community. Remember, you're supposed to be protecting the community, not doing things like this, which then makes the community not trust you and worry that you're assaulting the community rather than protecting the them. The problem also is is that, you know, I don't know, maybe this kid's totally lying. Maybe he stepped, maybe he mouthed off. Maybe, of course, he didn't, we know he didn't say anything bad because they'd include that in the report. So uh, maybe he did something. But they're suggesting, again, this imminent threat. You make a great point, walking away, holding a puppy. Hard to argue that you're an imminent threat. You may have disregarded a police order, but that's not an imminent threat. That's mm -hmm. a different issue. That's almost certainly not a felony. Um, uh, so. It's just you, when, when the response that we see all the time to this is, and I have more sympathy for police officers than you guys do in general in these cases, but what we can all agree on is that when the response of the cops every time is this immediate rallying the, the thin blue line, is that never in day two of the investigation do we ever hear, what's the kid's name? Tremaine? Sorry, Tremaine. We overreacted. We thought you were really mouthing off to us and we perceived a threat that wasn't there. Let us see the medical bill. We'll pay for your puppy. I'm glad everybody's okay and we're sorry. And if they said that, then we might not even cover it. Yeah. You know? Right. And, but, and, and what would happen is they would actually then gain the trust of yeah. the community because then people would say, oh, they're looking out for us. They just made a mistake. Mm -hmm. And people make mistakes and they're cops. They are de dealing with dangerous situations all the time. They overstep their bounds here, but they recognize it and we move on, right? right? I know, but humans are anti-apology all around. They I don't consider, know what you're about. Yeah, they consider that <laughs> weakness, so they don't want to apologize. And especially in the case of cops that are drunk off their own power, they're not going to want to go around and, and apologize, even if they do acknowledge internally that they were wrong. Well, I mean, about drunk it. off their own power, it's like, I mean, I don't know, the, the detective, believe me, there, Alvaro Zabaleta, who, the detective who we quoted in that, he wasn't there then. There's no detective investigating that case. Those would have been patrol officers. Officers. He's taken over this investigation and he's defending his guys. There's just a way to defend the guys. There's a way to do this without having it instantly become this giant conflict that obviously the parent, they're going to sue and then this is going to be a bigger story and it's going to go on and on. My hunch is you can get out of this right now. Mm -hmm. But they don't, it seems like that very seldom happens. Yeah, well, my last point on this is that I, like when Ben says the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, I, this is the part I agree with is that. I, he probably wasn't going to get his mom. He was probably walking away from the cops and being disrespectful, right? That you, you don't body slam him and arrest him for that, right? Uh, it, so he, I'm not assuming that he's 100, the kid's 100% correct. I'm just saying it's the job of the cops to be the responsible party here and to keep their cool. That's part of their job. So if a kid walks away from you, I know why you get frustrated, mm -hmm. but don't take it to the next level, as Ben was pointing out.